the guest today, Deirdre Freiheit, CEO of Shepherds of Good Hope and colleague and friend of all of us here in Ottawa, leading change in the community, and I'm so glad to see you today. I'm always happy to see you, Gordon. It's a uh, pleasure. It's, so we're going to have a conversation, and uh, we may not agree on everything, but we can talk about anything. Okay. And I love that idea that substance use health is a conversation we just have. Yeah. We're going through COVID. It's still with us. You're working with people that are in need of shelter, in need of housing, in need of medical, in need of mental and, and substance use health. How's the year been for you? Well, I think to say it's been a year, a year plus is, a, is a, an understatement. It's been challenging. It's been challenging for everyone. I think the, the biggest challenges are for those who don't have a home. When we all had a home to go to, when we were told to isolate, um, when we were told to you know, physically distance, you can't do that if you're in a shelter with six people in a room, and in the case of our overflow dorm, 30. Uh, you know, and a crowded shelter pre-pandemic, we were, you know, we had 300 people in the shelter. Um, it was crowded. It was uh, uh, not a great spot for everybody to be. So if you're told to physically distance and you don't have a home, that's impossible. So that was, that was a big challenge right at the beginning. It was tough. And, uh, you know, the most vulnerable people suffer the most usually. Yeah, and, and that's, I think, something that became really, really visible. There's something about having four or five people without housing on the street with 200 people going shopping and then only having four or five people without housing on the street. Yeah. That is a wake-up call to Canadians. Mm -hmm. It was, homelessness became very visible during the pandemic. And then, you know, when people are struggling with their, their mental health, their physical health, um, and they don't have the supports that they need, you know, everything shut down overnight. So the basic human needs weren't being met. People were in the community without washrooms. Uh, they were in the community without their supports that they would have had from, say, mental health supports when just everything shut down. And, you know, it's no wonder that substance use disorders have skyrocketed. It's no wonder that uh, mental health has, has mental illness or mental unwellness has increased significantly. Um, people are struggling and, you know, to, to try to figure out in a very short period of time, how do we shift every single service mm -hmm. to bring better support to people who really need it at that time, who don't have the support that you and I have? That was it. That was our biggest challenge. But I will say our staff were rock stars, <laughs> as they always are. And, uh, but really, Sean, in, uh, they're used to dealing with very difficult um, challenges every single day and this was another challenge and we just we we ran with it and I think our team um, along with all of our community partners really met the challenge but it is a huge challenge and we're really seeing the repercussions of the pandemic on top of everything people were dealing with because at the end of the day you and I both know that it's all about trauma yes I have a question awkward one and a, and a good one maybe mm -hmm. so the moment the community disappointed you the most in its response to the circumstances and the moment a community member, maybe in a surprising one, stood beside you that was a little surprising and comforting. The disappointment with um, the stigmatization of a group of people who had no support. So a lot of, I heard a lot of really negative comments um, and what was really interesting, Gord, was we did a uh, we did this uh, social media campaign called the Humans of Shepherds, mm -hmm. and uh, we we had people who were willing to be interviewed on camera about their experiences. And this was in the middle of the pandemic, and they they gave their experiences on camera, and they were very honest. And the response from the community was unbelievable. You know, when I, I stopped reading the comments a long time ago because I lose my faith in humanity when I read the comments section of, uh, you know, when we do an op-ed sometimes or when we talk about these issues because they're difficult issues for people to understand. Um, and so the comments were amazing. It was like, we've got you. You've got this. We're so glad you're part of our community. But interestingly, the exact same people who stood on the corner of the street in a group the comments that came in was, you're bums, you're junkies, you only want, 
your next fix. It was the exact same person, but it was amazing how when you, when you individualized the journey and the trauma of the person, how people's minds shifted to support, and then mm. how when people don't have a home and they're more visible in the community and they're standing out on the, the corner of the street because everything shut down and they didn't have a place to go and the shelters had to clean, for yeah. example, and people had to leave, they became very stigmatized and all of that old language showed up, but yet it was the exact same person. Wow. I found that fascinating. I found it disappointing on the one end, really um, amazing on the other end. Um, and I think what I think that was very difficult to kind of squ square up the two. And, mm. and I think we've got a lot of work to do with the community to help people understand that somebody's trauma doesn't change when you talk to them as an individual when they get into a group with their peers who might be giving them support on that day because they might be having a really rough day. The change in the lens and the change in the in how people perceive things, I found that disappointing and really highly interesting and great at the same time. And I think the other thing was the community did come together to from the point of view of donors. Mm -hmm. We had people coming out of the woodworks who said, how do we help? Because we know this is a really challenging time. That was very heartwarming. We had businesses that contacted us that we'd never heard from before, individuals who said, how can we help? A lot of volunteers who had to go home and stay home because of their own health yeah. um, helped out financially. Um, and others still kept coming in, the ones that we, you know, we had to, we had to, we had to shift and we couldn't have as many people in. Yeah. But they still didn't, you know, they still came. I find that human element is always just so fascinating. It's very powerful and I, I, I feel very nurtured, you know, because of that. When someone is known, you can't know someone without them being part of the community. And when it's unknown. Yeah. Right? The, the ability to reject. And that's been the history of the need for storytelling, the yeah. need for listening to stories. And of course, the courage of people to be able to say, you were yelling at me a few minutes ago on the street corner when there's five of us, but I want you to know that I'm somebody's son and daughter. I'm somebody's friend. I'm somebody's parent. I'm somebody. Yeah. Right? I'm a community member. Yeah. We're not outside the community. We are in the community. We are the community. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people forget, you know, before people end up in shelters and end up homeless, they've had a life. Mm. They, they, you know, we, we have people in the shelter who, nurses, physicians, lawyers, musicians, poets, you name it, they, they come from every walk of life. Something happened along the way. And aren't we lucky that you know, we being me, aren't I lucky that I didn't have that journey, but to judge somebody else for how they got there or, or not even for how they got there, but just that they're there. That's, that's, that's the challenge I think that we have around stigmatization of a population that, you know, they're you and me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I did some stuff with a peer group that's working, uh, comes from and, and works with individuals in those situations, you know, and the qualities that came out from that in terms of how they thought should be helped are the same quality you're, you're talking about, you know. And I thought to myself, you know, when somebody drives by, this is not who they think they're seeing, but this is exactly. who is there, right? And isn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just see love, compassion, caring for others, a big sign on everybody saying, yeah, I have all these qualities too. Yeah. And I don't have a place to live. Right. And, and I've, there's been some stuff and maybe some stuff happened to you and there was resiliency and there was community and you had a different outcome. Don't judge me by my outcome. Right. Right. Stop judging me by my outcome. Start thinking about how you could help me have a different one. Right. You know. So we had a chance to do some stuff together last year yeah. around supporting Recovery Day. Recovery Day is coming up again. But I want to talk about or have your thoughts on I don't want to talk. I'm not supposed to talk. Anyway, <laughs> what's the point of having a guest if I talk? <laughs> Anyways, we'll do the best with that. But we're going to have something new yet next year. We're going to have the WOW Festival working on wellness. And I wonder what you think about that big tent we're trying to build. I love it. I love the concept. I think... 
when we shift the when we shift the conversation to that positive outcome focused health focused um, approach, we take a lot of that negativity out of out of the conversation. And I think the focus on health and wellness and health and wellness is different for different people, right? Yeah. So when we talk about harm reduction, um, that's a that's a difficult subject for for people that don't understand it. You can still, you know, abstinence, of course, is great for a lot of people and probably the majority of people once they get to that point in their lives and they're able to do that. But there there are people who can still live well and live healthy and they may not be abstaining from using substances. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't deserve a quality of life or they shouldn't have a quality of life or they're not able to have the quality of life that they determine for themselves. And when I look at people, for example, in our managed alcohol program mm. or managed opiate program, you know, uh, once people get stable housing, which is really the key to all, uh, all of this, is and the supports that they need, they can do very well. So, so you see their health improve. You see them reconnect to their families and their friends. You see them be able to be part of the community where they didn't feel like part of the community before. They weren't well enough. Um, and, and they didn't have the supports that they needed. So focusing on wellness and wellness being part of the journey to get wherever you determine you need to be, where we don't judge what that wellness looks like, but we help you get where, where you need to be and you want to be as you decide it as a person. That, I think, is powerful. I love that idea. Well, in, in that witnessing, right, of, of that, and, and the understanding the language that the community, the broad community understands is the health language. Yeah. And when we start talking about, you know, the sort of a specific language that we have, whether that's the treatment language, the harm reduction language, I think we confuse the general public because yeah. they don't work in those fields. That's true. And so when we started talking about wellness, the general public goes, oh, yeah, I support wellness. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's what we're doing. Right. You know, and... But also the physical health, mental health, substance use health, um, the idea that those three are connected. They are. You know, so let's have a big tent. I love it. And that puts everybody on the same playing field, doesn't it? We all want to be healthy, whatever that, that meaning is to us. Yeah. I may want to eat better. I may want to um, exercise more. I may need to, if I'm you know, struggling with substance use, make a change. It's not up to us to judge how anybody gets there. It's how do we help you get? If I say the word physical health, you might think I'm going for a walk. There's a good chance you don't think I'm going to go for a run at my point in life. But, you know, many people do, but I won't be doing that. Right. right. But you don't assume I'm talking about a broken leg at the hospital. Right. If I talk about mental health, I may be doing a meditation. I, I may be taking a, a chill time. Yeah. You don't assume psychotic episode, hospitalization. Right. And then we have the end addictions. And yet 80% of Canadians use substances. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to broaden that conversation in the substance use health and recognize Canadian use substances and we want people who use substances to be healthy. For some of us, that'll mean not using them. But for most Canadians, I mean, using them in an informed, intelligent way where I'm making decisions around that, judging the consequences versus the outcomes. Yeah, and substance use is different things to different people. I might have a glass of wine on a Friday. It's still substance use. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, then we get into that, what, what substance is good and bad, and it's really right. just about health. Right. Do the substance alone. I think changing the conversation to health is going to be um, critical. And I, I think that also goes to a lot of the work you've been doing around stigma and ending stigma. When we're talking about health, there's we're not stigmatizing a person. We're talking about how do we help people feel better, whatever that looks like. Yeah. Um, how do you reconnect to your families so that you have a healthier um, support system? Yeah. There's all kinds of ways to look at it. But if we look at it through that lens as opposed to addictions, the, 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 the negative kind of connotations that have been attached to all of those words for so many years, then we can shift that conversation. It also changes how stigma is 
it, how it exists in our community. Absolutely, it's just, it, similar to your work with the homeless community saying, yes, I don't have housing right now. That doesn't make me a non-person. Right. Right. And right. so I can be in that place and still be a person. And that, that's powerful messaging and, and, and courageous messaging for someone to stand in front of the camera, camera and say, I am a person. Right. right. With, without housing. I'm experiencing something. I'm not something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things that we talk about a lot, which is homelessness is an experience. It's not an identity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And if we can start thinking about those things, that these are experiences, and then how do we help somebody with whatever the experience is that they're having, move to wherever that next level is, as they define it, not as we define it as a society, it's how they define it. I get to decide what I want to do. Yes. Why doesn't somebody who's homeless get to decide what they want to do? Um, in the same way, right? With the support, they can ask for whatever support they need. We're here to help. There's a community full of people, really good people, whether, whether it's organizations who, have, who are providing social services or people in the community who do know mm. that, that we are all part of this. We are all intertwined. And to your point earlier, someone's son, someone's daughter, someone's, someone's child or sibling or friend, we all know people who have struggled in one way or another. Maybe we don't know somebody who struggled to the point where they became homeless uh, and didn't have a home. Um, but we all know, there's, I, I would challenge anybody that I ever talked to to tell me that everybody has a rosy life and nobody ever has an issue. <laughs> <laughs> I understand there's some TV shows that look like that, <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't seen a real, you know, whatever what they call them now, uh, real life shows or whatever. But yeah. So, yeah so, now, there's been some great success in moving towards in housing. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the projects you've got going on right now? Sure. It's actually a very exciting time right now. Mm. Um, we are, this, by the end of 2022, at Shepherds of Good Hope, we'll be housing more people than we have in our shelter. That's our goal. We have 110 new units coming on stream in, in the next year. Um, that means we'll have housing from east to west across the city. And uh, so people have choice in mm. where they want to live. And for us, it's all about supportive housing because we know that, pe that the population that requires our services who uh, don't have a home Generally, not everybody, but generally, the most people uh, who come to Shepherds of Hope need some additional support when they move into housing, and often it's around the clock. So that's the kind of housing that we provide. With some, it's health and wellness supports in house. Uh, it's it's uh, activities. It's reconnecting with families. It's looking at. You know, we were talking earlier about uh, somebody may have a, a um, uh, somebody may have struggled with alcoholism. And if they are able to reduce uh, their alcohol use, or if they are able to stop using substances that are, you know, rubbing alcohol, for example, when they're on the streets, if they don't have the money to, to, to buy alcohol and they have that a struggle, once they get into housing, you see the difference with their health because they're not falling through those health cracks. They're getting the care that they need. They're stopping using all of those other things. They're not having to panhandle or steal or use up correctional services or yeah. emergency bed services in the hospitals. Providing that kind of support and wrapping that around the person when they're going into housing is something that's really important to us and we see the difference every single day. And very few people, once they have those supports, come back to the shelter. So we know that that works. So that's the type of housing that we're building. So I said we'll have another 110 units. We have a we're working on a building on uh, Maribel Road right now. We've just we've just opened another one on Montreal Road. We're going to be building on Murray Street, and we're expanding in Canada. So we have 110 new units coming on board for people who are currently homeless. And by by the end of 2022, we're hoping that 110 new people in our community will have new homes. And that's we're only a piece of it. There are others who are building as well. And I think that's the exciting thing that even though we had a lot of challenges during the pandemic, it also presented a lot of opportunities because homeless became so much more visible. And so governments came together and we were able to work with them to say, let's build 
let's get people into homes. And that's our priority right now. And it's really exciting to be able to say, we hope that there'll be fewer people in the shelter and, and that our goal is that there will be. You know, I started saying last year that we need to consider not, not, not what's wrong with people with green homelessness, but what's wrong with 33 million Canadians that allow them to be homeless. And I think part of that was that they uh, had become blind to that, right? And so it was, for whatever reason, Canadians got adaptive to seeing people without housing, you know? It was a time when it would have been shocking. Mm -hmm. You know, so that shock factor kind of disappeared and it became shocking again to people. And also, I think a sense of responsibility came back to them and realized those folks aren't going to fix that problem because they already would have. We better help. Not control, right. not demand, right? You don't have to do anything for us to care about you. You can just be who you are. But you should be inside. It's a cold country. Mm -hmm. It rains a lot. Mm -hmm. it's and it's snow. stifling hot. It's stifling in the hot. Right? Yeah. And then, you know, um, but yes, to recognize, that, you know, that we're not trying to warehouse you. We're not trying to put you out of sight. We're trying to house you and help you through your lives. And so, yeah, there's more to be done, yeah. more to be offered, you know. And I think that's so wonderful. And yet I look over my shoulder and I go, we haven't seen all the impact yet from this financial crisis. No. And so I'm expecting more people to enter a homeless experience going forward, even as we've done a bit of catch up to the existing. You know? So what do you yeah. see in the future? I think that, um, I think you're right. I think that, you know, especially, I think there are people who are living on the margins that we don't know about oh. yet. Um, and, and could enter, could very well enter this whole system that we have. Um, because there were a lot of people that struggled with loneliness uh, mm. during the pandemic. Uh, you know, you look at mental health and addictions, and I think, you know, when we look at Ottawa, there are a lot of supports. You can find food anywhere. We have a lot of places where people can go and get food. But the poverty of loneliness is something that leads people down some very dark paths. And, you know, I think that's going to be something that when people have been shut, shut inside for a long time, we're going to see more of that. We talked about that before the pandemic. I think that's going to be something that is going to be a struggle for a lot of people. Um, how do we reintegrate people into the community who may, be, who may have been struggling with being lonely and unsupported um, and then maybe resorted to um, you know, self-soothing in some way, right? Yeah, Using absolutely. substances to just deal with that loneliness and the lack of human connection. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be something that we'll be seeing over the next little while, and then we're going to have to watch that. Um, I, I think that we, I hope that what we're going to see is some of what we have seen, which is people, and not only governments, but businesses, communities, uh, social services agencies, just people saying that there are some basic human rights that we have ignored for a little while yeah. and we need to come together as a community to deal with that and how do we do that how do we make sure businesses get back to being able to provide services and give help people make a living um, that have struggled so much and how do we marry that up with yes with people who are in the community who need greater support so how do we make all the boats rise yeah. Well, and get some people some boats that don't have them. Right. Exactly. It's We you talked know. earlier. We're yeah. all, we might all be in the same ocean, but we don't have the same boat. So, so, and some of us <laughs> are treading water at best. Exactly. So you I know. think the mental health challenges are going to be huge yeah. in the next little while. I think a lot of people really struggled with their mental health. Um, I think a lot of people struggled with substance use disorders. A lot of people struggled with loneliness. Um, but the hope is that because that's more, we're seeing it, um, and we're seeing it more broadly as a community, that we've got to find a way to bring the community together and, and stop saying, how do we uh, move people out of this neighborhood or that neighborhood or, or find the service here but not here? You know, the, 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 we will deal with some nimbyism. We will deal with all of those kinds of things. But I think people are coming together and saying, how do we, how do, we do it? So let's come up with some solutions. And I'm seeing yeah. more of that, groups who don't 
na naturally come together mm -hmm. are starting to come together and talk about these things. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty positive. I'm very positive, you know. Uh, I'm always, I, I always smile a bit when I hear not in my backyard because it's sort of like that stigma uh, because it's the idea that people are already in your backyard. You have a family member in your household, you have a neighbor, you have somebody at work. Everybody is impacted around substance use in Canada, around mental health, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, to the level that you know somebody. And if you don't think they're in your backyard, it's because of stigma and because of how you're expressing yourself. Your neighbors, your friends, your family member hasn't told you about their struggle yet. You're hurting people you care about. And so, and of course, you know, it's done through ignorance in the true sense of don't know better. And so this education, a kind education, yeah. uh, you know, two fingers wagging at each other never got much done. That's yeah. true. And I think a lot of people care, but don't know how to help. So yeah. it's up to us as, you know, people who are working in this community directly with people who, who we want to try to help get those basic human rights. And housing is a basic human right. Um, having a basic income, you know, all of those, all of those social issues that have really bared their teeth during the pandemic. Mm. Um, I think people care. I think in some cases they don't know how to help. So it's how do we how do we bring people together in a way that says you can do the smallest thing and it will have an impact, or you can do something really big too yeah. if you have the means. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean that you everybody can do something. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the things that I find interesting is the idea that perhaps how I want to help might not be the help that's needed, and so I can be I can be inquisitive. Right. right. Because I may be figuring out what I can do from my perspective without actually having investigated. So I was talking to a friend just the other day who was seeing somebody, you know, in experiencing homelessness on a regular basis thinking, I think I'm going to make a sandwich. And I said, do you know if they eat sandwiches? Do you know if they're hungry? Right. Have you asked that? I said, so why don't you make a sandwich that you would eat and make two of them? Go visit, and you can say, hi, I don't know if you're hungry, but if you're hungry, I have an extra sandwich. Right. right. And then that idea is then that they can tell you then, you open the door to how can I help, and they may have a different way you can help. Right. Or they may be just really hungry and you're right, but, you know, check in. Yeah. Check in. Yeah. Right. I think sometimes we assume we know what people need as opposed to just having the conversation. And if we can't have the conversation directly with the person because they may be struggling with something and it may not be a good day yeah. for a conversation for certain people. Yeah. Um, you know, then then there are lots of groups and organizations and people working in the community who can help. So if you can't help one way, you can help another, another way. way. There's myriad um, ways to help. Yeah, be assured you can. Right, but don't think you know how to help <laughs> if you haven't asked the question, gotcha. to your point. Yeah, good. yeah. Because it may not be. And I think we all make assumptions. Oh, if I just do this, it's going to really help that person. But, but we, you know, if somebody said to me, how can I help you? I would probably tell them. Yeah. But if they didn't ask, you know, you, you, know, you yeah. have to ask the question. Yeah. You're right. I can always tell somebody what I would do in that situation, but I seldom know what they should do. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And we forget that. We assume that we know how to fix it. The, um, the moment when uh, we become inquisitive about how to help is the moment that we've personally changed. Mm -hmm. It's a very empowering moment for everybody. And I think communities that ponder that question, how can we help our community, are automatically healthier communities because they've now connected, mm -hmm. now become a community. Mm -hmm. Communities where people don't consider how they can help others can't really be called communities. Right. It's contra to the concept of community. Yeah. I remember a few years ago when we put a submission into, I won't say which government, um, but, but we put a submission into government for funding for housing. And we had an idea of what we wanted to do. We knew exactly what we wanted to do, but we, we at that time, we didn't have any property. Mm -hmm. So we knew we had to look for property. We knew we'd find it, 
but we just wanted to get the funding submission in through the cycle that you have, the, the window of time that you have to get yeah. it in. And it came back to say, well, you don't have land purchased, so uh, you can't, we can't give you the funding. Um, so it, we learned a lesson from that, which is go out, get the homework done. You don't necessarily, you do have to fit into certain boxes, but do your homework ahead of time. Get the land if you can. Uh, find a way to get the community to support you if you need it to get that land to purchase it to do the, this is one example um, so yeah. so the next time around we had done our homework we had the land we had the concept we had everything done and we were able to to successfully get the funding and we we were able to build what we learned from that is the preparation work that we have to have a lot of ducks lined up in order to fit those boxes because Governments can only fund in certain boxes. It's the way government works. It's not necessarily innovative. It's not necessarily creative all the time. We can be the innovative, creative people, but we've got to prepare for that. So we, get, we do all that innovative work first, and then we line it up in a box, and then we go for the funding. So what was nice about that, what, what was nice about learning that lesson is by the time the pandemic rolled around, so typically governments don't come to you and say, we have $12 million dollars. Uh, would you like to build housing? We have to say we need $12 million and here's what we want to do with it. Mm -hmm. And it has to fit into all of those different cycles. So um, we learned to be ready. So when the funding came down through the pandemic, which we would never have anticipated because the whole world didn't anticipate a pandemic, no. we were ready on three or four different areas. We had our ducks lined up. We were ready to go and we were able to take advantage of those opportunities. So I think you have to be nimble, Yeah. Uh, you have to plan ahead, and nobody is going to offer you something on a silver platter. So you have to do the work. And when you do the work, it pays off. And that's what we're finding now. And that's why next year, we're gonna be able to house way more people than we ever thought we could. But it was because we were ready to go when the opportunity came. And I think that's, as an organization, that's the way we have to, to do it. Um, but I think it also uh, gave us a lot of credibility with funders, too, because they knew if, if we go to Shepherds and we say there's a need, can you help us fill that need? We can actually help fund it. Um, they knew that we would be an organization that could respond quickly uh, and be nimble and, and take advantage of those opportunities. And I think it worked well for um, the funders the donors who want to see something happen in their community and want to support the work, uh, and of course, who benefits the most, the people who need it the most. So. Well, and I, I think two things I'm going to challenge a little bit. I think that's how governments operate. Yeah. I'm not sure that's how they work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so, but understanding how they operate is crucial so that you can work with them. Yeah. And it's really important those strategies and all that work that's gone ahead. And then I asked myself the question is, will one day, you know, the governments begin to ask, what do you need versus mm -hmm. here's what, yeah. here's our boxes. And the community, truly community led, whether that's yeah. regionally, provincially, federally, I don't care about politics, I, I, I care about people. Governments are there to support the well-being of Canadians. Mm -hmm. They all have different ideas about how to do that, but the processes have often blocked community-led yeah. projects. Absolutely. Particularly some wonderful ideas from smaller organizations because they don't have the infrastructure, right. they don't have the leadership to say, hey, I know what to do next time and we're never going to get caught like that again and have the resources to go and do that. Yeah, not everybody does. Not everybody does. That's true. Whether that's the leadership resource, whether that's the organizational resource, whether that's a community resource, you know, uh, again, going with that community wisdom, most communities know what the communities need. Right. That's the beauty of partnerships. Mm. And I think, you know, there are organizations that may not be ready or may not have the infrastructure, but to partner with organizations that do, that's what makes it. We couldn't do what we do without the multitude of partnerships that we have. We, we're not health and wellness experts. So inner city health provides health and wellness mm. supports in all of our programs. We're not uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and mental health uh, professionals. So the Royal Ottawa comes in with some supports for that or other places in the community. Inner city health and the mental health uh, nursing team there does amazing work. 
I think the partnership piece and building those relationships, it makes us a community. We are all a community. We all can do that together. So whether you play a little part or a big part or somewhere in the middle, it doesn't matter. What matters is, can we have the conversations to say, this is how we need to do things. This is how we're gonna put those partnerships together to make it happen. And then governments, you give them, you give them something to say, we can do this and you can play a part in this. Everybody then moves the dial forward. Yes. But one organization can't do it on its own. One person can't do, do it on their own. And so you're saying, let's end the competition. Yeah. Let's work together. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And I hear the clarity in your yeah. And sure. It's like, <laughs> obviously. Why <wouldn't> we? <laughs> right. And so that's yeah. the question, you know, uh, you know, because in the past, these funding pillars within the community itself uh, have brought a lot of agency focused activities. Yeah. Uh, and to an occasion to the focus of the agency versus those in need. Right. You know, I, and I say that with, with true uh, tenderness, uh, because many of these agencies were community led by yeah. individuals that get organized and then time by by and then eventually it was always a thirst for the next funding requirement right. so that they could be there and a long history of helping people. So, of course, they became interested in their own agency and their own right. selves. I think there's a lot of education that has to go on, too, because I don't think we tell our stories well enough. Mm. Um, one of the things that I know that, you know, years ago and years and years ago, you're right. There was a lot of competition and of course it still happens for funding. But uh, an interesting thing about shelters, which I think we have to stop talking about shelters, at least as they are here in Ottawa and many other places. We're not, we're not that old model of three hots and a cot. You don't come in and get three hot meals, a bed and get and get and leave the next day and have no other supports other than that. Yeah. And one of the things that we do, we being all of the shelters in town, around this idea of community partnership is talking about not duplicating services, really focusing on what services can we provide that, that, that make that collective. So if, if you look at just, just Shepherds of Good Hope, Cornerstone, the Ottawa Mission, Salvation Army, we work really well together. Mm. And we do a lot, a lot of housing um, and the others do also do some housing, but they also do, we do harm reduction. We serve all genders. Yeah. You know, the mission has a, a dental clinic and a hospice for people who ha need end of life care when they are without a home. The Salvation Army provides a lot of programs and services, outreach in the community, uh, financial planning for people, family services. When you look at that, we're not shelters, emergency shelters in the traditional sense of the word. We are health hubs, we are community hubs, and we work together very well to say, if you have a hospice and a dental uh, clinic, we're not going to do the same thing. Yeah. We're going to send our, our, our you know, people to you who need those services, or we're going to let them know that they can access those services. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also let them know that if they need supportive housing in the model that we serve with harm reduction services or mental health uh, and aging and those kinds of things that we may have a place for people who are in your uh, in your shelter. So we're not talking about shelters in the traditional sense. And it goes back to the conversation, which is we have to find a way as a community to work together. Yes. And yes, there will be competition in some ways for funding here and there. But really, when we look at where are the gaps in service and who can provide those gaps and how do we help you do that and how do you help us do this, that's where we're going to be able to help the most people move on. And, it's and relationship building, isn't it? Which is why we're going to have the WOW Festival. Exactly. So that we can all gather together one place and make this uh, hopefully nationally of interest to Canadians that it is a big tent and that we're all in the tent. Right. And that all of this stuff matters. There's areas of expertise, there's areas of lap crossover, there's areas of send over kind of stuff that you're talking about. But, you know, for me, we're in this unfortunate position here in Canada where the next 20 years is going to be uh, an incredible growth in the needs for mental health, substance yeah. use, health, and physical health of Canadians. Aging population around physical health, mental health coming out of COVID, substance use health coming out of COVID, coming out of pre existing conditions. Yeah. We don't have to worry about 
a shortage of need. That's, that's the, for sure. That's the, 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 the tragedy. What we do have to worry about is effective implementation of, of best practices, community source and community focus results. We're not yeah. all the same. There's cities and towns, there's rural, there's metropolitan areas. We're going to have different solutions, but yeah. we need to be in this together. And at the end of the day, people want to help. People want to do good things. And most people want to help um, those who they know are struggling. So it's just how do we, how do we have that conversation in a healthy way? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so we just had one, I think. I think so. Wow. And so <laughs> we're going to sign off for now. And uh, we'll see you in a few weeks, but also we'll see you at WOW next year. Yes. And thank you so much for all that you're leading in the community. Back at you, Gord. Well, you know, we did mention partnership and stuff. And exactly. So. It takes a village. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I won't use my line, all the fools in town are on my side. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. It's thank a pleasure. Thank you. Thank for you very much. Me. Okay.